Breaking news tonight, a crack in the disappearance and dismemberment murder of a beautiful teen girl, Sade Robinson. Did the spoiled brat son of a Milwaukee millionaire lure Sade on a date turned murder? Good evening, I'm Nancy Grace. This is Crime Stories, and I wanna thank you for being with us. p.m. April 2nd, Cudahy police respond to a call along Lake Michigan. At Warnemont Park, a popular recreation area, a park goer reports finding a severed human leg. According to a post from Cudahy Sheriff's Office, the limb was found in or near the water east of the golf course near the pump house. There are steep cliffs leading to the shoreline in that area and large numbers of police canvassed the area, and kept away gawkers. Three days after the Warnemont Park discovery, another call to police about a severed body part. 11 miles away from the shores of Lake Michigan in a Milwaukee West Side neighborhood, a body part is found at a playground. Within 24 hours, police respond to another call about the discovery of human remains. On Saturday, just a few blocks from the same West Side Milwaukee area as Friday's discovery, police set up a crime scene near a park. After a car is found on fire, paired with a pet tribute blanket found near some of the human remains, police begin to focus on a beautiful young teen girl, Sade. Listen. Sade Robinson graduates with honors a semester early from Riverside High School. She continues her education at Milwaukee Area Technical College, working towards her associate's degree in criminal justice. In fact, she's only a month away from graduating, but Robinson hasn't been spending all her times in the books. She works through high school and college at the Pizza Shuttle on Milwaukee's Lower East Side. She makes such a difference at work that her coworkers say Robinson is considered the heart of Pizza Shuttle. Former owner Mark Gold says she is the type of employee who never calls out and is loved by customers and her coworkers. You know, I just... Joining me is a very special guest along with an all-star panel, seriously, the Brain Trust. But just hearing uh, Holden Zappel speaking from CrimeOnline.com about Sade, she's everything you want your child to be. She's this fantastic student. She is working while she's going to school. Very close family. Tons of relatives in the military. And she is inspired to consider the U.S. Air Force. I mean, this is the girl we all want to have and just look at her i remember my grandmother i would give her my school picture every year and she could say i can just see see the mischief coming out of your eyes look at this girl can't you just see the joy the just the love of life crackling smart just beaming out of her how in the world did she collide, cross paths with an alleged spoiled brat killer, the son of a Milwaukee millionaire, a former ex-high school football star, now a 30-something bartender? You know what? I want to get off him and back to Sade. Let me see that beautiful face again. Liz, I want to see that picture of Sade in her, look at her. <laughs> I like the one of her in her, she's at home. There's a big cross on the wall behind her and she's got on her, she's getting ready for capping. Yeah, there, there, oh my goodness. In addition to our all-star panel of trial lawyer Eric Faddis, renowned psychologist Dr. John Delatore, 
death investigator Professor Joe Scott Morgan and investigative crime reporter Alexis Terezchuk, a special guest joining me. This is Sade's mother, Miss Sheena Scarborough. I didn't know you were going to hold that up. It just showing that says it all. It just says it all. You know, Miss Miss Scarborough. Whenever I have to travel for work, my backpack is so heavy because I have all these mementos of the twins I carry with me and set up wherever I am. No, I hear you talk about it your twins just, a lot. It's, I it's just telling me to think twins. that you have this picture instead of your girl. This First of all, tell me about Sade. Sade is a beautiful, beautiful soul. I, I knew that my kids were very special and different. They we were, were my parents raised me, they raised us. We are light workers. We put out positive energy, we exert, we help others. I'm a community advocate as a personal way of my life, the way I live. I, I've worked for others, I help others my whole life. I've raised my daughters that way. My daughters have excelled. I have two daughters. This has caused so much emotional effect to my family. Her, her, my parents who love my baby so much, her grandparents, her uncles, her aunties, the community. Everyone has pulled up. This has affected many people in Milwaukee. I'm coming here today. This is the hardest thing I would ever have to do in my life to speak Shadi's voice. Shadi was a beautiful soul. She was an amazing girl. Nancy, everything you spoke was exactly what my daughter exerted. I couldn't have asked for any better daughter. There was things my daughter did that many adults were not even able to accomplish in their lifetimes. And I'll be 43 in a week. My birthday's on April 27th. Shadi's birthday's on May the 10th. I had her on Mother's Day. The son of a, I'm gonna watch my language on this platform. The son of a took my daughter from me. A month before she's graduating with her Associate of Arts degree. She works so hard. She's a full-time student. She has two full-time jobs. She has her own little bachelorette apartment. She doesn't stay in a college dorm campus. She has her own bachelorette apartment. She has her own car. She pays all of her own bills. This is traumatizing, Nancy. I never expected this to pull up on my front door. This isn't normal. This is a 2024 Jeffrey Dahmer. I need him held accountable. I need justice for Sade. There has been a lot of, in a many black and brown girls that have been called missing in Milwaukee for a moment. And all of them are going to be held accountable now because they put, they messed with the wrong family. They mess with the wrong family because we're not going to sit quiet and we're not going to sit still. And we're going to call all of them out and we're going to speak for the whole community. Because I'm not about to sit down and I'm not about to sit still on this one. It's justice for Sade, Nancy. It's justice. Miss Scarborough, I feel like anything, anything I or anybody on this panel could say right now, it, it pales compared to what you just said. And believe me, Miss Scarborough, this story of Sade has not just touched people in Milwaukee. It has touched people around the world. And when you say you're not going to sit back, neither are we until there is justice for your girl and the other missing and murdered girls across Milwaukee. They're not all just missing. They're dead. 
many of exactly. them are dead. Guys, with me is Sade's mother, who is in so much pain, but she is joining us tonight to speak out for Sade. What happened? What led up to this night? Yes, Nancy, this is, yes. Nancy, the last time I spoke to my daughter was on Easter Sunday, okay? We seen her, she came by my parents' home. We spent the Sunday together. This was Easter Sunday, okay? Um, I cooked for them, both of my daughters. We all met by my parents' house where I'm currently at. We all commute here. All my girls are busy. They're, my youngest is 16. They have a lot of activities. They're working. They go to school. I have very successful and independent, self-sufficient daughters. We harm and hurt nobody. We just put out and help others into the universe, okay? So I see, like, she is just very, it's like, she's a 19, 20-year-old young lady, okay? We all, at this age, we have a lot of friends. She's not in a relationship. She didn't have a boyfriend. She wasn't tied down to anyone. She's single and she's dating. I knew she hung out with her coworkers at Pizza Shuttle. Um, they went out to little bars and hung out sometimes. I'm a very concerned mother. I'm very overprotective. I always would put in Shade's ear, be careful. I don't trust these people around Milwaukee. I'm just that extra type of mom. And my daughter's always, mom, just sit back. I try to give them space, let them be independent. But I've just been having this vibe and intuition. And I have been wanting her just to, like, not hang out and go out to places for some reason. And I don't know exactly, and I'm still trying to find out the facts. But I know that this type of indi this individual, and I want to make clarity because there's been a lot of trolls there's been a lot of media i can't interact and deal with i'm grieving my daughter right now i want respect i need time i'm gonna this is about advocating not only for my daughter but for all of the young women that are missing and for the actions that have been taken to find my daughter and just there's a lot of information but i need the community and people to know that my daughter helped others she was a positive spirit this this like they they're claiming this was a first date like you know it's just a first date i don't this dude never she never mentioned this dude to us and well, i I've we're learning talk, a little yeah. bit about that we're learning a mm -hmm. little bit about that take a listen to dave mack crime okay. online a month away from turning 20, Sade Robinson tells a maintenance worker at her building that she's excited about her first date with 33-year-old Maxwell Anderson. Robinson texts Anderson about where to eat and tells him she's feeling seafood. Anderson takes Sade to a place he used to work, the Twisted Fisherman. After dinner, they spend some more time together having drinks at Duke's on Water. The couple leaves Duke's together around 9 p.m. Straight out to Alexis Tereschuk joining us, CrimeOnline.com investigative reporter. I want to make sure that we're right about that. Um, this was, at most, a first, maybe a second, but most likely a first date. Probably nothing that she was r telling everybody about. Um, tell me how we know, Alexis, that the two actually went out. Because... Uh, Reports are in our investigation tells us that there may have been either surveillance footage or witnesses placing placing them to at Twisted Fisherman where he worked and then later at Dukes on Water. How do we know that they were together that night? They met there. There are multiple surveillance cameras outside these restaurants, both of them, that show her arriving walking through the east side of the restaurant. He arrived on the west side of the restaurant. There's such good video footage of this. This is just such a good, helpful part of the case. They go there together. He used to work there at the Twisted Fisherman. So the bartender there spoke with police and said, they came in, they sat at the bar together, they had a drink. It seemed friendly and casual. Nothing 
that would alert the bartender to anything that was wrong. He said they just had a few drinks and they left within an hour. They then, according to surveillance, leave together surveillance videos to the next place. Joining us in All Star Panel to make sense of what we know right now. But to Miss Scarborough, this is Sade's mother. Miss Scarborough, when did you real? I know that right now you're at your parents' home. I know that Sade, as you beautifully described it, had her own little bachelorette pad that she paid for from her two jobs. She's working while getting her college degree. Amazing. So when did somebody realize they needed to call you and ask, where's Sade? Yeah, so it was Wednesday, Nancy. I, I was at my job. I went to work that morning. I got off. As soon as I got home from work, um, I was receiving calls from, like, my, my, my mother, my brother. We were all concerned because we all have the 360 location app, okay? We all share it as a family. So I have the app shared with me, my mom, both of my daughters. And then my daughter also shares Sade, my oldest daughter, also shares the app with additional friends and like other groups. But I have my own group with her, myself, my mother, and my youngest daughter. So we seen her like at this location from Monday. Like again, Monday night, she I seen her getting, I mean, Monday morning, I seen her getting ready for work. She FaceTimed me. Then she, that evening around 3, 45, 4 o'clock, I got a text message from her asking a cash app for $15. My daughter does not ask me for money. Like she has, my daughter makes more money than me. Okay? Literally. She's, that was that boss. Okay. So like, it doesn't a big deal. I'm just that type of mom. You need something, I'm going to cash app it. It's very strange that she asked me for $15 at you know four what's very p.m. odd about that, Miss Scarborough? It reminds me of when Gabby Petito went missing, and her family started getting texts that didn't sound like her. For instance, she wrote about her grandfather. She texted about her grandfather, but she called him by his full name. That would be like me uh, writing my producer right here, Jackie, and going, Hi, Jackie. How's Jackie today? It just doesn't make any, it's just wrong. So you get this test asking for $15 and Sade would mm. never have done that. I mean, she, if she no, needed, she, would, she, would she could have charged, Nancy. Apple Pay, you name it. So you knew right then something was wrong. And then this, take a listen to Chief Jeffrey Norman. On Saturday, April 6th, MPD continued the search of in the area and located additional human remains on the railroad tracks. Later in the evening on Saturday, April 6, MPD returned to the area when Miss Robinson's family located her blanket. At this time, detectives located additional human remains. According to court documents, the remains found Saturday included human flesh and a foot. The foot had pink nail polish, possibly matching the polish on the leg found days earlier. Nancy, uh, can I say something really... real briefly? I'm sorry, I don't mean to cut Yes, you. please do. I just, I just, I just want to clarify that the community, I want to make this clear, okay? And I'm going to be holding all accountable that have been, I'm not blaming or attacking people. There have been detectives and sergeants that have been pulling up selectively on my team. There has been the community, there have been active members advocating for this case. I know it is affecting many, but there is some faulty things that have been being handled, Okay. First of all, I want to correct all of the, the chief executives that are pulling up from my county and my community that are not pronouncing my daughter's name correctly. I respectfully thank you, Nancy Grace, and your team, the way you guys pulled up respectfully, asked me my name, asked me my daughter's name, and asked how to pronounce it. I respectfully thank you for that. I wanted to tell you that, first of all, and foremost, because a lot of these, a lot of people are pulling up and being disrespectful. And this is my own community, the mayor, the chief executive. They have not pulled up to my front porch. They have not told me they're sorry. They have not sent their condolences. They're on the news talking stuff. And the community are the members who found my daughter's remains and other items the second and third and the fourth time. It, they, the police was not doing a job the first time correctly. 
for the community to keep finding stuff and doing their own search parties because I'm too weak to go out there and search for my daughter. I'm sorry, Nancy. Don't be sorry. Don't be sorry. You're right. And I got to tell you something, Miss Scarborough. Guys, you are hearing Sade's mother. I always do that every case. And I did it with every case I ever investigated or prosecuted. And this is why this may mean something to you, Miss Scarborough. Because when my fiance was murdered at his funeral, it didn't make me angry or mad. But I remember in the middle of the funeral, I noticed it. The pastor kept referring to me as Mary throughout Keith's entire funeral over and over and over. I mean, I wasn't angry, but I, I remember it to this day. And it's just one of those things that just stick with you. I know you don't care what any of these politicians say, but for Pete's sake, at least get the name right. At least do that much. Um, guys, uh, we're, we're talking about, it's so hard for everybody on this panel to talk about this with Sade's mom with us, but she says she wants justice, and justice comes at a price, let me tell you that, and that price is suffering, and she is suffering right now, but I'm going to talk about these facts, because these facts or what I pray to God are going to put the son of a Milwaukee millionaire behind bars for life because I believe in DNA. DNA cannot lie. Science cannot lie. Joe Scott Morgan, we just heard very upsetting details about fingernail and toenail polish on the remains. You tell me, guys, Joe Scott Morgan, Joseph Scott Morgan, renowned professor of forensics, Jacksonville State University, which has an incredible criminal justice program. We've reenacted several crimes together. He is a professor of forensics. He is the author of Blood Beneath My Feet on Amazon. And now he's the host of a hit series, Body Bags with Joe Scott Morgan. Joe Scott you know, we talk about DNA all the time, how you can match this and that, and every action has a reaction and leaves a trace. But when it comes down to human talk, like the color of Sade's toenail polish matches the color of her fingernail polish, we're talking about a severed leg and a severed arm. And somebody at the medical examiners went, look, the fingernail polish matches. I don't need yes. DNA. A jury's not nope. going to need DNA, but they're going to have it. Why? Uh, because every contact, as you mentioned, does in fact leave a trace. We've known that for over 100 years now. And it's coming to fruition here in, this, in the world in which we inhabit. Uh, you know, you think about things like tool marks and all these other identifiers, fingerprints traditionally. But DNA is going to play a big role in this. And we're talking about proximity, Nancy, with the alleged perpetrator here. He will have had a very intimate contact, unfortunately, with Sade. My apologies, Mrs. Scarborough. I know that this is very painful. But there will have been an intimate contact on some level. Just this idea of dismemberment alone is going to leave a trace behind. And it's not necessarily his trace on her as much as it will be her trace on him potentially. And ultimately, it could be her, Sade, that actually brings him to justice. That's one redemptive point along this because her DNA will be found on him and it will be pointing a big accusing finger back at him. On Wednesday, April the 4th, our investigation led to a person of interest, Maxwell Stephen Anderson, who lives in the 3100 block of South 39th Street, where he was arrested after a traffic stop near the home, a search warrant was conducted. Not only did blood evidence emerge in his home, this guy, this idiot, technical legal term, left a phone trail 
a mile wide. You know, when you look at his home, you think, wow, beautiful yard, immaculately kept. You know why? Not because of him. 33-year-old former high school football star. He's a nepo baby, nepotism baby. This 33-year-old guy, Maxwell Anderson, has a millionaire dad who ran a Milwaukee insurance brokerage firm. Now, what do we know about him, Alexis Terezchuk? He has a rap sheet. He has been arrested for domestic, I'm sorry, not just arrested, convicted for domestic abuse, for disorderly conduct, and for drunk driving. This guy has a rap sheet a mile long. He is not an upstanding citizen of the community. And the, as I said, these are not just arrests. We're waiting to hear from. He has been convicted of all three of these things. Did you just say he's not an upstanding member of the community? You know what? That because Sade is, is. Look at her putting family, perfume her on friends. the pig. Guys, listen to Sydney Sumner Crime Online following what Alexis has just told us. Growing up the son of a millionaire businessman, Maxwell Anderson was a Catholic school prep football star with a bright future. Anderson works for his millionaire dad's insurance companies with limited success. But when his father moves to Florida, Anderson stays in Milwaukee working as a bartender. A former co-worker of Anderson, Samantha Brenner, describes Anderson as erratic, sometimes getting drunk while bartending at Victor's nightclub. A friend describes Anderson as childish and having quite the temper. Joining me right now is renowned forensic psychologist and mediator, Dr. John Delatore. Now, Delatore, no offense to bartenders, my brilliant niece tended bar for a while uh, while she was in graduate school. Uh, long story short, what do you think this mom and dad are thinking about right now? They pump all this money, all this time into their son, it turns out to be a 33-year-old abuser of alcohol bully tending bar erratically when he shows up to work. Yeah, listen, they probably know who he is. And, and, and I'm going I'm to be real frank with you here, Nancy. This isn't the first person that he's done this to. Sade is not the first person. This, this, this is someone who has a long history, and I'm not surprised to hear about a rap sheet with disorderly conduct and, and domestic abuse. This is not someone who just one day decides that he's going to uh, stalk a 19-year-old and then dismember. This isn't someone that does that. This is someone who has been long planning and been engaging in problematic behaviors, escalating them each time so that eventually he's comfortable with actually doing the things that he's been fantasizing about. His parents knew who he was and they tried and they did whatever it was that they tried and they did to get him to not do those things. But ultimately, he was going to do it anyway. Reminder, the 33-year-old suspect bartender Maxwell Anderson has not been convicted, simply arrested at this juncture. Delatory, you're also airbrushing the truth. Let me talk about this guy. Police find a foot, a pe a appear apparently human flesh at a playground, pink nail polish matching up, in the home, they find blood, gasoline containers, packages addressed to the defendant, very important, blood on a comforter, blood scattered throughout the home. Let me tell you this, and I'm going to go to you, Faddis, with me, high-profile trial lawyer, uh, TV legal analyst, founding partner of the Warner Faddis Elite Legal Group. Eric, I agree with Delatore. This isn't his first time at the rodeo. You don't go from zero to 120 MPH in two seconds. There has to be something, some revving up, up to not only a murder, but a luring, luring her onto a date. How many times do you think he watched her come in, have a drink, have dinner, anything like that? before he gets the guts up to say, hey, would you like to go to dinner? He planned this. You think you go from zero to murder and dismemberment 
in one night. Oh, I agree with Miss Scarborough. This is not his first time, and Delatory hit it on, hit the nail on the head. What about it, Eric? Yeah, Nancy, it's chilling to think about what was going through Maxwell Anderson's mind, allegedly, as he appears to have been preparing for this. You know, the details give rise to a predatory nature here. There's a huge age gap, right? And, and then there's also a friend who says that Maxwell Anderson had a five foot by six foot deep hole dug in his backyard. And then we look at the rapidity, how, how quickly um, it, the, the, this turned from a murder to dismemberment in, in a, in, like over Overnight. That's not something that just happens on a whim, in my personal opinion. That's something that was planned out and, and is just grotesque in terms of what we're learning. There's so much in this guy's criminal history. Of course, he is presumed innocent until proven guilty in the current case. You know, I'm looking at a photo of him holding onto a strap in a bus. Apparently, the Milwaukee Transit captured the face of the subject boarding and remaining on a bus. Um, the booking photo seems to be the same guy wearing the exact clothing depicted on the subject who fled the scene of the car arson, including a large tan backpack with tan stripes. Also feeding it, there's the shot, Alexis, that we got from the affidavit, which is very lengthy, that goes to corroborate the gas cans found in his home. He is the guy, according to police, that burned Sade's car that she worked so hard to buy all on her own, holding down and there was two jobs for while that. going to college. Uh, go ahead, please. There was an eyewitness to the burning of the car. As Sade's mother said, this community did everything. When it happened, he, well, the eyewitness said they saw a man in a jacket with a backpack close the door of this Honda and flick a lighter into the car and it burst into flames. And so the person started screaming, he did that, he did that, he did that. And he, he ran away. But that person contacted the police to tell them about being the actual eyewitness to him burning it. This was absolutely the community being on their high alert and really helping out here. A neighbor's security camera shows two figures entering Anderson's backyard at 9.24 p.m. At 12.47 a.m., a street camera shows Robinson's car departing Anderson's home. A camera at Cudahy High School shows a car drive toward the pump house at Warnemont Park at 2.53 a.m. A figure is seen walking from the road and climbing down the bluff to the beach several times. At 4.31 a.m., the car leaves the park. Three hours later, bus surveillance catches a man carrying a tan backpack walking away from a fire at 30th and Lisbon. At 8.12 a.m., Anderson, carrying a tan backpack, is seen boarding a bus heading toward his home. Anderson gets off at 8.35 a.m. and enters his backyard eight minutes later. To Joseph Scott Morgan, professor of forensics, Jacksonville State, Joe Scott, what do you believe those tan backpacks are going to reveal? And how is the search of the backpacks, and I don't mean open the backpack and take everything out, I mean the forensic search of the backpacks, what are, is that search going to reveal? They're going to take that thing apart piece by piece, Nancy. And I can tell you down deep in those fibers, you're going to find DNA evidence. You'll be able to actually see perhaps uh, body fluids, and I'm talking about blood, just with the unaided eye, that might actually appear as they are actually taking this thing apart and looking at it. And they need to, and they need to take a look at all, I mean, all of his clothing in that house. I, you know, I got to join in in unison. I got to join Ms. Uh, Scarborough in unison on this, on this particular point and you as well, Nancy. I think that this place should be locked down and every square inch of it has to be examined. I mean, gone through with a fine tooth comb because I don't think this is his first rodeo. You do not get to this level of violence. And I'm talking about post-mortem violence here. It just, just instantaneously, it doesn't happen like this. This almost seems practiced 
uh, in one level. You have to have the tools. You have to have the ability. Now, in that basement down there, that's going to be a treasure trove of biological evidence. My curiosity is piqued in the sense is, do we have any kind of layering of evidence there? Are there any other biological samples down there that are not necessarily belonging to those of Sade? Has, have any other potential victims been down there at any potential time? I think that that's very important here. Can I throw a scenario, jump on, jumping off what Joe Scott Morgan is saying to Eric Faddis? Everybody jump in, please. We need all of your brain power. Eric Faddis, think about it. You just told us that in the perp, the alleged perp's backyard, there was a grave dug. I mean a full-on grave, five feet, I believe you said. What person does this? You have murdered a teen girl and you dig a grave in the backyard and then you think, oh wait, you know what, never mind. I'll just go through a very lengthy dismemberment and then I'll scatter this little girl's remains all across Milwaukee and hey, nobody will piece it together. Well, he was wrong. My point is, Eric Faddis, was that grave for somebody else? What else is in that backyard or in his childhood home backyard? I mean, what has this guy been up to? Yeah, I mean, that's the alarming prospect here is, is for whom was he digging this five foot by six foot grave in his own backyard? You know, um, his friends were talked to and a lot of them said that hey, he had a creepy, weird vibe. He had erratic behavior. He may have had an alcohol issue. And then we look at, um, you know, there are gas canisters found in his home. Um, this quickly turns from date to homicide, to dismemberment, to scattering human remains all across Milwaukee. It's just not something that happens on spur of the moment, Nancy. To Dr. John Delatore joining us, um, renowned psychologist and mediator. Dr. Delatore, I, I don't get it. A guy that's born with a silver spoon in his mouth, uh, sent to a, a fancy Catholic school, football star in high school. You know those people that their glory days were when they were in the ninth grade? Um, that's him. Then his dad gives him a job through nepotism within the insurance company, the insurance brokerage company that the dad owns. That didn't last long. Then he wanders around and ends up bartending after several, let me say, brushes with the law. I agree with Ms. Scarborough. That whole place, his whole house, needs to be taken apart the way Rex Heuerman's home was, the Long Island serial killer suspect, and searched. Because I'm not completely convinced that that grave he dug in the backyard was meant for this teen girl this beautiful teen girl, Sade Robinson. So what else will we learn? So my question to you, Dr. Delatore, is how do you go from a silver spoon in your mouth to three hots and a cot and an orange jumpsuit? It takes a long time. Again, this isn't someone, people don't just snap. Right, that's a complete misnomer. People don't snap. This is years of him building up to get to this point. Now he's explored other ways in which he's going to be engaging in violent acts, whether it's using alcohol or whether it's uh, domestic violence, intimate partner violence, right? But it's not just this house. It's, it's any place where the family used to live or property that the family would own, anything that he had access to. This is someone who wants to be comfortable when he's engaging in these violent acts, using the properties that he already knows provides that sense of comfort. And then he likes to flash it. As we see, this isn't just disposing of body parts. He's putting it out in places for people to see, for people to get scared. This is someone who wants to be known for engaging in these kinds of violent acts. Ms. Scarborough, you haven't even been able to have a funeral yet. Why? Yes, that's correct, Nancy. Um, this is probably the hardest part that we're struggling with right now. Um, trying to find peace, laying my daughter to rest, get solace. Um, just give her her transition that she deserves because she was taken too soon. My baby was only, she didn't even make 20. She was 20 in a few weeks on May the 10th, Nancy. They don't, they can't even provide us with a death certificate right now. 
the fuck? They don't even know the cause of my daughter's death. They don't know when. Like, they not giving me enough information, Nancy. This is so frustrating. There is no closure right now for me and my family. And everybody have to plan things. But I will be having a, a community gathering this Friday. And I will be letting the community know where what time in the, the place and event it will be at in Milwaukee. Um, just to, we'll have a candlelight balloon release. Um, I cannot even plan a memorial for my daughter right now. Like, you cannot even proceed. Everyone, also, I want everybody to know that there will be a fundraiser for Sade's funeral. Go to Justice for Sade, and that is spelled S-A-D-E. Like you would say, Said, like Sage. It's pronounced Sade. Justice for Sade, our fallen angel. Ms. Garber, before we sign off, I just want you to know how much we are praying for you and thinking about you and your whole family. And we will not rest until her killer gets the maximum sentence in that jurisdiction, which is life without parole. Nancy, thank you. God, please thank be with you. Sade's family. This is Shana wait, wait. right here. These are her earrings that came in the mail yesterday, Nancy. I don't know if you can see them. I had to go to my baby's them. place for the first time. And um, these came for her. These are her earrings. And I have her earrings on. These are my baby's earrings. Like, this is so traumatic. Oh. You know what's so funny? Look what I've got. My dad's shirt. <laughs> My dad that passed away, I don't know why. I just feel better having it with me, like your earrings. Guys, let's just stop for one moment and remember an American hero, police officer Michael Jensen, just 29 years old. Jensen shot in the line of duty Syracuse, New York, leaving behind his loving parents and sweet sister. American hero, police officer, Michael Jensen. I want to thank all of our guests for being with us, specifically Sade's mother, Miss Scarborough, who suffered greatly to get Sade's story out, and to all our other guests, but especially to you for being with us tonight and every night. Nancy Grace signing off. I'll see you tomorrow night, 6 and 9 o'clock sharp, Eastern. And until then, good night, friend. Guys, thank you for watching Crime Online with Nancy Grace here on YouTube. To get the very latest, subscribe to Crime Online here.